Hey, John here. So by now you should recognize this. We've got our full adder and we have a complimenter over here that we can use in combination with the carry in in order to add and subtract using the same full adder circuit. What if we add one more OR gate? Let's see what we can do with this now. All right, we can tap off some extra wires on our full adder. We can generate a couple of other things. So let's look and see how this thing works. We already know how to calculate the sum and the difference using a full adder with the complementer and setting the carry in on the least significant bit and all that fun stuff. What's this other thing about? Well, if we look at the signal right here, we know it's the output of this XOR gate whose inputs are tied to the A operand. And as long as this complementer is off, right, as long as there's a zero here, this is B. So this signal coming out of this gate is A XORed with B, is it not? So we can steal that out of the full adder. If we ever wanted to calculate A, X, or B, we don't need extra gates. We're already doing that inside here, is my point. Same thing is true if I ever want to know what A anded with B is. Again, as long as this comp signal is a zero on it, this is going to be A anded with B. And likewise for the OR, all right? Now, there's no extra OR gate in here that's calculating a, a useful A or B value. I mean, there's one over here, but that's not what it's doing. These are useful, recognizably useful, okay? There are instructions that we need to be able to implement in a CPU that can perform adding, subtracting, XOR, ANDing, and ORing. Once you actually have these functions, you have enough to just write any old C program if you want. You know, most, most languages they have operators and things you can use for bitwise adding and subtracting and so on. This is a pretty useful circuit at this point. So then what do we do? Well, we have four different things it could do. And in fact, it does do all these at the same time, all the time, right? Uh, but which one of them do we want to use? Well, we can just put a multiplexer over here. We don't need to talk about the insides of this. We all know what a multiplexer does. You give it a, uh, a two-bit address or a, you know, an, a number to select which one of two to the n inputs we're going to have. So if I have four inputs, we need to have two uh, address lines or function select lines. I'm going to call them in this particular case because this is an arithmetic logic unit now. It's not just an arithmetic unit anymore. We can do both uh, adds and subtracts as well as these logic operators, all right? So depending on which four of the things I want, I'll put a different binary number on these F lines and it will propagate the one that I've selected out of Q using this multiplexer. Now this whole big circuit, we can draw this nice little simple truth table, okay? <laughs> depending on F0 and F1, I'm either doing the sum or difference and the, what I'm doing here depends on the carry in and the comp input that you saw before. But if F0 and F1 is set to 0 and a 1, I'm generating an XOR on the Q output of my multiplexer, right? This over here is what I'm talking about. You know, I got a 1, 0 on there. I've got the AND. If I got a 1, 1, I have the OR, okay? Now, let's take a line and draw a box around this entire schematic drawing and abstract it into a single box. If I do that, what do I look at? Well, you get these little boxes, these little indicators over here will be the signals that we care about. These reach out of the abstraction, okay? That's uh, what my point is of showing you this. Let me I can get the zoom just right on this, okay? So what do I got? The carry in, the A operand, the B operand over here, this thing called comp, which is used to invert the B programmatically, right, on demand. The carry out is hiding right here. And the Q output is over here. And we have our function control over here. The, the things that choose which one of these functions we're gonna output in Q, all right? So if we were to do this, and we just draw a box around it, we end up with this. All right, now you're going to kind of recognize, you see this line that's going through here? If we put a bunch of them together, you would expect to see the carry chain, right? There's our carry chain going through these boxes. Carry out, 
from one, what we call a slice. Okay, each one of these is a single bit slice. That's a standard uh, term for what we're doing here. Uh, the carry out of one goes into the next stage, right, for the adding and the subtracting. We need all that. Down here, you'll recognize these XOR gates generating the signed overflow status and the unsigned overflow status. And you see that extra line down here that we saw in our, sub our dedicated, you know, adder and subtractor circuits, our multifunction adder subtractor thing. And it will reach around up in here and you can see it's connected to a signal I called subtract, right? When this is a one, I need to have the carry inset and I need to have this line here goes down and around to tell it to flip the unsigned overflow bit status right we've seen all that before the only other thing on here then is this F0 and the F1 and we've just saw there's that multiplexer hiding inside here all right so what does all this stuff do why did I wire it this way well I hope the carry chain's obvious if F0 and F1 are both zero as you saw in the truth table the multiplexer inside here is just giving us the sum or difference depending on what we told the adder to do. So when F0 is a zero, F1 is a zero, and subtract is zero or false, we're adding A0 to B0. So that would be the sum. Carry would go down here. Now, we want the same F0 and F1 on each one of the slices of our ALU, right? We don't want the least significant bit adding while the next bit is, you know, subtracting, and the next one here might be doing an exclusive or, and this one could be doing an and. That doesn't make any sense at all. You know, when's the last time anybody needed that, right? <laughs> There's pretty low demand for machines that do that. So what do we do? We connect the F0 and F1. You see these lines? All of the F0s are all connected together, every one of them, all the way down. And all these F1s right here are connected together. And we see that comes out over here. So if we drew another abstraction and put this whole thing, all these bit slices in there, and the unsigned overflow uh, status indicator in, 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 in the signed overflow indicator in there. And all this, you see all these little, again, these little boxes with the labels on them coming out of here? Those would be the only things that are sticking out of this thing when we abstract it away, okay? Again, a closer look. Um, A0, B0, we got A1, B1, A2, B2. So all the A operands, okay? All the bits of the A operand, I should say, all eight of them. And all eight of the B operand bits would come into this thing, right? So I can add, I can subtract, I can and, I can or, and I can XOR. And because ALUs are fairly common, it has its own custom symbol. It looks a lot like a MUX, except it has a dent in it right here, okay? Sometimes it'll have a, a uh, uh, it won't have a flat in there. It might just have a notch, okay? But nonetheless, when you have a thing that has a notch in the middle like this that otherwise looks a lot like a multiplexer, that's what an ALU looks like, all right? So this is the simplified symbol for what you see on the rest of this sheet. Let me just zoom out here. We can see the whole thing at once, right? So here's all eight bits of our ALU. You can see the function lines are all connected together. The 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 complement input to the all the XORs that are complementing the B bus, those are all connected together. And you see this little wire here reaching around there to set the least significant carry in to a one when we want to subtract also. Okay? So buried inside this simple symbol is an entire ALU. You see all the A's right here. You see all the B's right there. These two flat thingies on the top represent the inputs. The bottom represents the output. Again, it looks just like a multiplexer. And here's our eight uh, outputs. 
and our signed and unsigned overflow status outputs. And these are the uh, the control lines for our ALU. So we have the function zero and the function one. We already saw the truth table for that in the bit slice. This is new. The subtract is new. And the signed and unsigned overflow are new, right? Because on this sheet here, we call the, each, each one of these pages as a sheet in a schematic. Uh, we create new signals in addition to the ones that we inherited by pasting all these bit slices in here, right? So the subtract actually connects the comp and the CI. That's why you don't see a CI here. You don't see a comp here. You don't see the A and B. You don't see all the details down here. All right. This is the schematic and hardware equivalent to writing, like I said, a subroutine. We've talked about this before. You abstract this all away, you're not going to see some diff and A and B and all that because this is hiding in this abstraction away inside this box here, okay? And the rest of the stuff on this sheet, like the CI and the comp, are all hiding in the abstraction that's hiding inside of this ALU, all right? So now we can also draw a truth table for that ALU. All right, what do we got going on here? We have the A's, we got the B's, we have the Q's, sign on sign overflow, F0, F1, and subtract. So the F0, F1, and the subtract are our control inputs. And we can abbreviate our truth table quite easily here. However many bits A re is represented, right? Uh, that's all of them. So what is Q, right? Q is the output of our ALU, okay? When F0 and F1 are both 0 and subtract is a 0, remember subtract was hooked up to our carry in and the complementer control here, all right? What are we doing? Well, we're obviously adding, all right? We can jump down here for a quick look ahead. If, a, if the function is set both to zeros, right, but we turn on the subtract, remember the adder is still doing the addition, but with this thing set to one, we've complemented B and we've added one using the carry in. So that's why you say A minus B over here, okay? All right, when F0 is a zero and F1 is a one and subtract is a zero, right? It doesn't make sense to turn on the subtraction control when we want to get an XOR out of here, okay? And again, these three items are just copied directly out of the truth table down here. If you look closely, 0110 and 11 for these values, A, X, or A, and B, A, or B. And up here, it's the same thing, 0110 and 11, A, X, or anding and oring, okay? Now, when we turn on the subtract bit, and we're performing the otherwise performing an addition, we end up with a subtraction, and we beat that dead horse. We know that. We know how that works by now. But look at these other weird cases down here. If you have the subtract bit turned on and you decide, hey, I want to see the XOR function. Well, you're not really going to get A, XOR, B. You're going to A, XOR with B bar. Okay, same thing with the AND and the OR, right? Because the subtract bit will screw up the value, right? Because subtract runs in here and it's connected to this input right here. So this will cause B to become B bar right here. So if you're asking about the XOR function, it'll be A XOR with B bar when that is true. That'll flow out over here. And if I want to look at what's on this line here, I'll again end up with A. That's an AND gate, so it'll be ANDed with, when this is a one, this will be B bar. So this will be A ended with B bar if I turn this on. Same thing if I do the OR, it'll be A ORed with B bar, okay? Now it turns out, you know, when you simplify circuits like this and you use them for multiple purposes, sometimes you can end up in situations where they can perform other functions that are just utterly worthless, okay? I would argue these are pretty useless things, okay? However, this is what this circuit would do. It's wonderful quiz fodder. You know, what would this what does this ALU give you if you have a one here and a zero there and subtract is on and you look at this drawing here? Well, you can clearly figure it out, right? Because you look over here, you see that subtract 
is connected to comp and it's connected to CI and it's connected to the comp on every single one of these uh, slices. Okay, it also gets down here too. Yeah, okay, fine. But when you look inside that abstraction, it's going to do exactly what I just walked through. All right, so don't get caught up by these superfluous things that we allow to happen in order to simplify our design, okay? We just, you know, don't use these. You know, doctor, doctor, it hurts when I go like this, right? That old joke. The doctor says, well, don't go like that, <laughs> okay? So if you don't want it to generate some garbage, don't do this, all right? So what do we end up with here? We have an arithmetic logic unit that can add, subtract, XOR, and and it can do OR operations, plus some weird things that don't make sense. It'll also generate a status output to let us know if we have a signed overflow and we have an unsigned overflow during additions and subtractions. Now, because, again, all these gates are on and running, they're all doing something all the time, right? Why didn't I show the signed overflow and the unsigned overflow in this truth table? Well, if you really wanted to show what this signed overflow bit represents and you want to do it in a truth table, note that the inputs of this XOR gate for the signed overflow and the unsigned overflow depend on every one of the A inputs and every one of the B inputs, plus they depend on the current value of the subtract bit for that to all be in one truth table what are we looking at we're looking at 16 signals for all the a's all the b's combined there's eight a's eight b's that's 16 plus subtract is 17. now we might also want to show the f0 and the f1 so that would be 19 bits now it turns out the f0 and f1 have no impact on the carry out right they're over here. Carry out only depends on stuff over on the left. So technically, the carry out, or rather the uh, yeah, the carry out that goes into these gates is really only dependent on 17 input variables. So how many rows are in the truth table if we have 17 binary input values? That's 128,000 rows. That's why I didn't put those in here, okay? I'm going to just assume that everybody knows what signed and unsigned overflow are and what they mean when they look up here. When is this a one? When I have unsigned overflow. You want to know what unsigned overflow is? Go watch my other lecture, okay? <laughs> Nobody would write a truth table with 128,000 rows in it. Now, this is just one ALU design. There's many other kinds of designs. This only has a few operations. You could have uh, ALUs that do multiplication and division, and maybe they even have floating point uh, adding and subtraction. You can do all kinds of things, depending on how many gates you want to put in there. This one was intended for this simple lecture to be kept as simple as possible, yet still practical and useful. And we will see that you can build an entire RISC-V CPU using this bit slice for your ALU. At the most basic level, a RISC-V CPU will have an ALU in it that only has this functionality. Now, they don't have 8-bit ALUs. They have 32-bit ALUs. But I think you can see... We could just simply add more of these stages together, more slices. This is, I only had enough room for eight. Do we really need to show <laughs> another 24 of these? I, no, we don't. Okay. So here's an eight bit example. You just simply add more slices, extend this thing out to the left, and create yourself a 32 bit ALU with these functions, and you're in business. So that's really all there is in a minimalist kind of uh, ALU design that's actually practical and you can even build a real CPU out of one of them. Thanks for watching. See you next time.